Welcome to a special Friday edition of Hit 'em High, presented by Kings Mark and Cabinets, alongside the Eagle great Seth Joyner with Everett Terry. I'm Scott Seidenberg, and we're here live at Parks Casino, getting ready to break down the Eagles' 34-27 win on Thursday Night Football over the Green Bay Packers. A reminder: share this video with your family and your friends. Be sure to give us a comment. For every share that we get, one dollar will get donated to the Malcolm Jenkins Foundation, a different charity each month. Why? Because sharing is caring, guys. Now, the Eagles improved to 5-0 and on Thursday nights under head coach Doug Peterson. And, Seth, you wanted more out of their rushing attack, 176 yards, two rushing touchdowns for Jordan Howard. They took a little bit, you know, from our show name, hit them high. But they hit them <laughs> high, and they hit them low last night with the combination of Jordan Howard, the combination of Miles Sanders. Hey, listen, for the first time, and I don't know how long, the Philadelphia Eagles had more production in the running game last night than they had in the passing game. Now, a lot of people who, who advocate for um, franchise quarterbacks, you know, they're going to look at Carson Wentz stats and be like, well, he didn't really have that good of a game. Well, he only threw for 160 yards, but he had 115, you know, um, quarterback rating. He threw for three touchdowns. He wasn't sacked. He didn't throw any, any interceptions. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with us out, out, outpacing teams on the ground rather than the air because when he had to throw and he had to make plays, he had the time, he had the opportunity. You put the, the offensive line in a more aggressive mode when you come out and your objective is to establish the line of scrimmage and run the ball first. And when, once you do that, I mean, the first play of the second half, they came out and I said, run play action pass. First play they ran, play action pass. Zach hits Zach Ertz in the flat, you know, uh, for a nine yard gain. You got second and one right where you want to be. So your ability to run the ball, in my opinion, allows everything else in your playbook to come alive. And when you do that, now you don't get Carson beat up, you don't have him run around all over the place, and the offense operates a lot more effectively and efficiently when you're balanced, run the pass. And E.T., you wanted to see more out of Jordan Howard. Miles Sanders did get the start mm -hmm. and rushed well, was effective, especially in the return game, mm -hmm. but this was the Jordan Howard game. It was, and we wondered when the breakout game was going to come. We've talked for three weeks about the fact that in order for the Eagles to have success, why not give the ball to the guy that they traded for, a guy who was productive in his career and Chicago and a guy who's known to run between the tackles. When we talked last week, we said, listen, what made the Eagles great on their Super Bowl run is that ability to run between the tackles with Garrett Blunt, even Jay Ajayi between the tackles. They weren't doing that effectively. Miles Sanders is not that kind of a back, but they finally listened. They must have watched the show, gave it to Jordan <laughs> Howard, let him get the ball in between the tackles and just gash and gash and gash. I had him in fantasy. It was a great night for me. Three touchdowns always helps. The other piece that we noticed that we saw as well is in the passing game, having Alshon back was huge. But the bigger piece is, hey, Nelson Aguilar was a non-factor, and you know what? Maybe there's something to that. They didn't throw to get the ball. He didn't have any opportunities to make any mistakes. And ironically, Alshon Jeffrey did what he was supposed to do. Zach Ertz got a ton of targets, and they were successful. So, I mean, maybe long-term the solution is, hey, continue to keep Nelson on the field because his speed is effective out of the slot, but don't necessarily have to use him as much as they were using him in weeks past. And as they get healthier, they should have some more success. Hey, listen, man, it's 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 a non-starter. You need to stop with that. Come man. on, man. The, I'm going to call it. The, 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 when you get Alshon back and when you get a, a healthy Dallas Goddard, because what, you know, Goddard was back up last week, mm -hmm. but you can tell in, in pregame that he wasn't 100%. Mm -hmm. He looked like he was 100% today, or well, last night. And that's the difference. That 12 personnel, that one, one running back, two tight end, that's a critical piece to what they do. You know, they ran a screen off of it. They run double outs on the backside off of it. They run a lot of different things off of, off of that, that personnel group. And, and I think, you know, even with Alshon back, that was a big deal to be able to have that part of the offense up and alive, you know, for Carson Wentz. Now, hey, listen, Nelson is not a high volume target guy. He never has been. He never will be within the scheme of this offense, okay, because he's never going to be the primary. But he was asked to do that last week, and he was out, outside of his comfort zone. I'm not going to kill the guy because I'm telling you right now, there's going to come a point in time in this season where he's going to have a big game for them. Yep. They're going to need him, mm -hmm. okay? So all of this hoopla about, you know, killing Nelson and catch babies, you know, better than Nelson, all that, <laughs> all that kind of, all that kind of nonsense, stuff. man. Yeah, hey, listen, you, we're going to need that guy. And I don't care. I don't care what anybody says. He's an integral part. He was an integral part, you know, during the Super Bowl run. At some point in time during this season, he's going to play an integral role. And you know what? At the end of the day, 
through four weeks, he's got three touchdowns. But one, one other thing on the Eagles offense, they have to get off to better starts, okay? Mm -hmm. Blanked in the first quarter for the third time Again. in four games. And this is becoming too much of a trend that Eagles fans are not happy with. Right. So we've talked about them starting slow. We've talked about the fact that they struggle with scoring early in games. They're one of the worst teams in football under Doug Peterson with that, uh, that early game scoring. I don't know if it's that their first 15, their script of plays are just not getting it done for them. Maybe they need to mix it up and go different. We saw them come out with a bit of a different game plan and they had more success as the game wore on. But getting off the slow starts, again, they got away with it because the Packers, um, from my understanding, when they go up 7-0, literally were 58-0 and mm. when they have a, a first quarter lead of seven or more at home. So the fact that they lost the game up like that, you know, with Aaron Rodgers at the helm, you know, they got away with it. But that said, I think that they need to focus more on trying to find ways to score effectively and get points on the board no matter how they come. Well, the problem is, you know, you look at the time of possession here, the, the Packers' first two possessions, they eat up 10-31 and 14-01. Mm -hmm. You know, so really the Eagles didn't really have the ball that much in the first half, and they were trying to establish the run because in the first half, my goodness, they ran the ball 19 times if you factor in Wentz's runs. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't really running for his life, so a lot of it was, you know, I think at least two of them Design were quarterback rush. sneaks. Um, but they ran the ball 19 times, and he only threw it 13 times in the first half. When was the last so, time they did that? Yeah, but, but, when you're, but when you're talking about only, you know, what, 32, 32 plays and a right. half, man, right. that's really not a whole lot of plays when you talk about what the Eagles averaged and their distribution of how they did it. Um, I like the way they did it. But it just seemed to me that, you know, you're right. They just haven't been in a rhythm as far as being able to get started on the right foot. And, and you really know what really kickstarted the offense was the Miles Sanders kickoff return. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that gave them an infusion of adrenaline. And I think that's when the offense and everybody realized, you know, everybody got excited. It was almost like there was no adrenaline flowing through this football team until that time. And all of a sudden, he runs it back to the 35, to the Packers 35, and everybody's hype. Defense is hype, offense is hype. They come out, they punch it in the end zone, and, and the offense is off and running. I want to give a quick shout out to the Best Damn Eagles group on Facebook. Over 70 members watching right now. Be sure to comment on the video. We'll read your comments and answer your questions live here on the show. And share the video because for every share, $1 is going to get donated to the Malcolm Jenkins Foundation. The offense, all good, guys. Defensively, here we go. There's an eye-popping stat that I want to throw at you guys. The Eagles are one of six teams this season that have trailed by at least 10 points in every game. Those other teams combined won 13 and one. The Eagles, of course, two and two. But you can't be trailing by double digits in every game. This is not. This can't, this can't continue. Well, well, you know what I noticed? Uh, last week, Seth was at the whiteboard doing work, and he talked about that uh, that cover three, and it looks like they're still running it because every <laughs> time I looked up, I saw Devontae Adams, and I saw Sidney Jones trailing behind, Devontae Adams running underneath, nobody's there, he's catching the ball, or he's ziplining. I mean, that first pass, you want to talk about dropping it in the bread basket. He's running full stride. The pass is on the money. You can't play better defense than that, mm -hmm. but every time they went to Devontae Adams, he was wide open. He was, no matter where he wanted to be, he was open. I, listen, we talked about getting Jalen Ramsey. He clearly doesn't want to be in Jacksonville. They need a corner. They need a corner bad because it's clear that teams are going to target wherever they are on the field, whoever their hot receiver is. That's where they're going to throw the ball to. And, again, they got away with a game, you know, yesterday because the offense was effective. They ran the ball effectively. But that's not going to win the rest of the season. You're going to have to find ways to get your defensive secondary to be able to make plays. Yeah, in the second half, they played good football. You know, it wasn't as bad in the second half as the first half. I, I just – you know, today for today for Eagles fans is an opportunity to be, you know, celebratory, you know. But when I look at the defensive side of the ball, you know, I just got to keep it 100. You know what I'm saying? Um, Corey Underland and the way he's coaching these cornerbacks, it's a problem, man. Mm -hmm. it, and I don't care what anybody says, it's a problem, you know. Because when I see, you know, Avante Maddox bailing with his head back at the quarterback, whether he's supposed to be in man, or whether he's in zone, out you know, position. he's out of position. You know, when I see Rasul Douglas continuously getting these PI calls, you know, and, and other other DBs on the team getting these PI calls, you get penalties like that when you're out of position, mm -hmm. you know. And a lot of times they're in position, they're in position physically. It's the other last little bit, okay. If I'm running down the field with you and this is the sideline and I got 
and, and you're running on the outside, the 12th man is the sideline, okay? Mm -hmm. All I need to do is get this hand here and feel you. Now I can look back at the ball and make a play on the ball. But they're running and they face guard. So they don't know where the ball is half the time. You know, you're playing man coverage, blitz man coverage from five to six yards off. You're telling the wide receiver, go ahead and have that slant. Go ahead and have that five yard speed out until we start getting up at the line of scrimmage and not just pressing. Sometimes we get up and we press and then we bail. If I'm going to get up in your face, I'm going to put my hands on you. At least I'm going to take my one shot and make you take a defined release, okay? These cornerbacks look tentative. They are supreme athletes because they're in the NFL. Don't tell me that these guys can't play. They need to be coached the proper way so their skill sets and their abilities and their talents can shine through. And they're not getting that coaching right now. We I don't agree. care what anybody says. We agree. So is it coaching or is it the players? Judy tweets out at us. You got to go out and get Jalen Ramsey ASAP. You've been saying it, ET, a player like that certainly helps any team that he's on. We've talked about it in weeks past about do you want that type of character in your locker room? But is it the players or is it the coaching philosophy? Hey, listen, you, you know, I can tell you right now, Jalen Ramsey is an in-your-face type of corner. Mm -hmm. So anytime he gets man coverage, you're not getting anything over nope. there. They're going to go the other, other way side. because the other, the other DBs, they don't play that way. They don't get up and put their hand on you, take their one jam, He's and make you physical. release a defined way. So you can go get Jalen Ramsey, but I'm telling you right now, all of y'all that's crying about Jalen Ramsey, when you go and you get that guy, and he comes in here and he's a distraction to your football team, he's a cancer in your locker room, I don't want to hear it. Go ahead, Howie, go get him. Make sure that everybody's happy. All the Eagles fans that wants us to go get Jalen Ramsey, go get him. And when he becomes a problem in the locker room and the team and the team begins to falter because of his antics in the locker room, I don't want to hear it. So I'm going to disagree only because of the fact that the Eagles have a history of getting controversial character guys, okay? They've went and got T.O., they yeah. went and got Michael Vick. This locker room with the guys, the leadership here, can work handle out? a Jalen Ramsey. No, What's this with T.O.? Nobody What's handles, with T.O.? Listen, nobody, with T.O.? nobody handles Jalen Ramsey. We don't Jaylen, know that. He's yeah, played yeah, for an organization that's crap. Jalen Ramsey wants to be the highest paid corner in the As league. As he should be. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Okay? But, you know, you want to know who the best cornerback in the league? Who? Stephon Gilmore. No, stop. Go no, look at the numbers. No, yeah. go look at the numbers. Go look he's at the numbers. He's playing with Bill Belichick. He's doing, the same, he's doing the same thing that Jalen Ramsey is doing down there. And you want to know why Jalen Ramsey wants to be paid? You want to know why he wants to be in a man scheme where he can shut down, be a shut down corner? Because he wants to be paid. He wants to be paid like Stephon Gilmore. As he should okay? be. And he knows that Stephon Gilmore right now is getting more love than he's getting. You can't call it the scheme. You can't call it the scheme. Boy. Stephon Gilmore goes with the best wide receiver on the opposing team, and he's doing what Jalen Ramsey wants to do. I'm telling you right now, okay? And his motives, I'm telling you, they're selfish. It's going to be a problem. Nobody, nobody handles Jalen Ramsey. Because Jalen Ramsey feels like he's his own man. He's calling his own shots. He feels like he's in control of his career right now because he's, he's at the top of his game. And he's the best player on that team. He's the best player on that team. So now, what, what, what about the scheme, though? As Juan sends in a question, why aren't we doing more two safeties over the top to help out our defensive backs? I saw a lot of single high last night. I've seen a lot of single high with the Eagles so far this season. Why not put another safety over the top? You, you have to. This, and the reason why we were so successful running the ball last night, because every time they went and do too high safety, that meant that they only had six guys in the box. Yes. With the tight end on the, on the line, that means that now all of a sudden you got, you got man blocking, blocking block. across the board, okay? When you, go, when you go seven guys in the box, you got a free hitter. You know, especially if teams are going to run 11 personnel, 12 <laughs> personnel, which is, you know, um, one tight end, one tight end, one running back, or one running back, two tight ends, that dictates, you know, what it, how, your, how your coverage looks. So if teams are going to come out, you know, the Packers don't run a whole lot of 12 personnel, but they run a lot of 11 personnel. Yes. So if you've got that much 11 personnel, that means that, you know, you, you're, you're either nickel or you're dime. And because of coverage responsibilities, you have no other choice but to run single high safety. And we all know Jim Schwartz loves to blitz. Now he, he is never shy about that. So you're taking away a defender because you're sending an extra pass rusher. My problem continues to be, and I think it's because they're really not a, um, a blitz 
you know, right. they're not a blitz-oriented team. My problem is still they show the blitz too early sometimes. I'm watching the game last night, you and I look it. up, and they're showing it. You can't show a blitz early in the play clock against of Aaron all Rogers. people. Aaron Rodgers. Okay. Cook them every time. A lot of the big plays that he made were in blitz situations. Mm -hmm. And I get it. That's when a coach like Jim Schwartz would be like, well, see, that's why I don't blitz. You know? But when you're not getting the pressure up front, your hand gets forced. Okay? But what they need to work on in practice is how do I – I mean, how many times you see Aaron Rodgers with the hard with the hard count last night? And holding it. Count. And holding yeah. it. Okay? Yeah. Why is he doing that? Because he's trying to get you to show your hand. Okay, and what they've got to do, they got to realize that he's not going to snap that ball until he's 100% sure what you're in. And you've got to delay to 10 seconds in the clock, on the play clock, before you walk into what you're doing. If you show him what you're doing with 15 seconds left on the play clock, he is going to check and put him in the best possible position, and he's going to hurt you. Now, when you're playing against lesser quarterbacks, they can do that against Sam Donald this week, this upcoming week. And, and they're going to they're gonna wreak, some, they're gonna wreak some havoc. But you can't do that against Matt Ryan. That's what happened, you know, with the Julio touchdown. You can't do that against a Matthew Stafford. Can't do it. And you can't do it against Aaron Rodgers. You, they really got to work on disguising their blitzes until you get low into the play clock. So the quarterback either has to call timeout or he got to run what's called, and the protection has got to deal with what's coming at him. E.T., in terms of the importance of the victory last night, considering the NFC East standings and the way that it could get away very quickly if you would have dropped to one and three, we know we cut the season down into quarters. You can't go one and three in one quarter of a season. It puts too much pressure on your schedule. How important was that win last night? Well, you, you look at what upcoming games they have coming up. So they've got the Jets, or terrible, they should beat the Jets. Um, and the next big game on the schedule, in most people's minds, is the Cowboy game, which is three weeks out. That's going to be the game because, I mean, if you look at where the Cowboys could be, they could be 5-1, and one, maybe even 6-0 and oh by then. So at that point now, if the Eagles, let's say they win their next two and then they come into the Cowboys, now they're 4-2 against a 5-1 and one or 6-0 and oh Cowboy team. Now that game becomes huge for the division. If you want to have a shot at the division, that's a game that, you know, you needed to be 2-2 two two at this point. Most people had them winning the Lions and potentially dropping this game. So 2-2 two two is where most people had them through the first four. So they're pretty much right on par. But that 1-3 would have been... You, you want to talk about shattering. At that point, I don't want to say you want to mail the season in, but they would have needed one hell of a run to try to turn it around at that point. And you just look at the division games they have left, I don't know if they were able to get there. So this one was big for them. And how do you take advantage now, Seth, of the mini buy that you get by playing on a Thursday night yeah. and having the 10 days off? Well, you get a lot of guys who are banged up. You get them an opportunity to Sean. rest and, and heal up. It's an extra 10 days to get Deshaun back in the mix. Um, it's an extra 10 days, you know, for how we work his magic and kind of figure out what we're going to do in the secondary. It's, you know, for Avante uh, Maddox, yeah. you know, that, that these 10 days will be monumental if he's OK. And from what I understand, he's yeah. fine. Yeah. I heard that, you know, he was laying on the stretcher and he was cracking jokes with his, yes. with, with his teammates. So he's going to be fine. But getting him back and, and get him, getting him up to full speed is going to be major. I like him better on the outside. You could tell that he hadn't played on the outside in right. quite some time right. last night because he looked he didn't look good at all. Nah. You know, they've been playing him in the slot. But, you know, to talk about the schedule for a second, I'm telling you, man, um, everybody's concerned about these next eight games because the Eagles have got the Vikings, the Cowboys, the Bills, the Bears, the Patriots and the Seahawks. OK, let's stop right there. Okay. Those are all good defenses. All good defenses. <laughs> but, but they I'm, might win three of those. But, but, but I'm going to tell you the truth. The, the, only two, the only two teams that really worry me, you know, is the Patriots. As they should. And the Seahawks. They seem to have the Vikings number. Yeah. If they don't beat the Jets next week, I'm just going to retire. <laughs> I'm, I'm just... I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just going to retire from this all broadcast. This was a fun show, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm retiring from from all broadcast mediums, and I'm going I'm, I'm going in the hiding. You ain't even gonna see me no more. Okay, they got the Vikings numbers. Um, if they can't get up for the Cowboys, come on, man, that's the greatest rivalry in the world. I mean, I, I'm done. I ain't got nothing left. But if Jim Schwartz called me and said, "Hey, come lace it up for the Cowboy game," I'm going I'm going out there right now. Okay, so if you can't get up for that game, the Bills. They got to go to, to Buffalo. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a tough road game, mm -hmm. but they should beat the Bills. Sure. Okay? They should beat the Bills. And then the Bears. 
They're Double at home. going is going. Cody they, Parkey's out of there. They're, they're at home. They're at home against the Bears, and Mitchell Trubisky is still Mitchell Trubisky. That's fair. I mean, realistically, they can go on a little run here. They beat the Jets one, the Vikings two, the Cowboys three, the Bills four, the Bill, the Bears five. I mean, realistically, I mean, even if they go four and one over that stretch and then figure out a way to split between the Patriots and the Seahawks, they're sitting right where they want to be. Mm -hmm. I think everyone's in a good mood today on this Friday because of the Eagles' victory. It could have been different yeah. if the Eagles lose that game. We're all singing a different tune here this Friday morning live at Parks Casino. We're not <laughs> having smiles on our faces, and we're talking about the end is who's near. And, and who's putting on the hot seat? He's just mad because he <laughs> lost his bet last night. All he had to do was call me. I would have told you. I, I don't know. <laughs> Listen, I had Eagles in the over. That's all that matters to me. I'm pretty happy about that, Seth. <laughs> wow. You know, when, when I look at the... the the number last night and people wanted to say oh Packers are at home you know that's why they were favored by four you know the number actually started out at three people bet it up to five and then it came back down late because more people realized hey maybe five is a little too much right. to give this Eagles team was there a little bit of disrespect dare I say going into last night's game from the not, not just the betting public but the NFL public saying the Packers are 3-0, the Eagles are 1-2, they're going into Lambeau. Not many people giving the Eagles a shot. Despite their undefeated record on Thursday night, Tom to Doug Peterson. Alshon and Jeffrey and Dallas Goddard made such a huge difference to the offense. You know, Seth talked about the, 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 the 12 personnel, which is huge for the way that they had their scheme. They didn't have it last week, they had it this week. That helped with an effective running game. But having Alshon on the field, a shorthanded <clears throat> receiver who's going to catch the ball, <clears throat> a guy that you know wins trust beside Ertz emphatically with throwing him the ball. Ertz had a busy night, but nothing that was going to light the world on fire. But Alshon catching the touchdown, it was key. It was, it was key that having him on the field changes the way that Wentz reads the field and being able to open up the offense. So from that point of view, having him there, knowing that he was going to play and be healthy enough to play matters because now it changes the way that the defense schemes. You know, if you're prepared for Nelson Aguilar to get 10 targets, it's much different than if you're looking at Alshon to get, mm -hmm. you know, six or seven targets. It's very different, you know? So that, that to me, is what really kind of changed. And again, you didn't really know until almost near kickoff that he was going to play for sure. So, I mean, it mattered, but, it, you know, it is what it is in football. It happens sometimes. Well, you know, Alshon's a chain, chain mover. You know, yeah. I, I, I would love to see in comparison how many of his catches were big catches on in third down situations. I mean, the Eagles are like phenomenal in third down third last down. night. You know, they're four or six in the first half, and I think overall they finished, you know, almost 56%. You know, as a, as a defensive player, I know that, you know, you're always aiming, you know, to hold your opponent to about 33%. That's phenomenal on third down. But to be able to convert at, at half, over half of your third down conversions, that's, as a defensive player, as a defensive unit, you're allowing them 50% more shots on third down. I mean, that's major. So I, I think as we, you know, I said in, in post game last night, you know, we got a glimpse the second half of the Redskins game of what this offense can really look like, you know. And we didn't even really run the ball all that effectively. No. I mean, if we get Deshaun Jackson back healthy, get all our pieces back healthy, and the offensive line, you know, gets the rolling and we're running the ball early, man. This offense can be what everybody envisioned it being, and they can alleviate some of the headaches and some of the problems that we're facing on the defensive side of the ball. You're watching Hit Em High with Eagles great Seth Joyner with Everett Terry. I'm Scott Seidenberg. Be sure to share the episode on Facebook because for every share, we are going to don donate $1 to the Malcolm Jenkins Foundation. We're coming to you live at Parks Casino, and of course, Seth, we're brought to you by King's Market Cabinets. Absolutely. Hey, listen, it, everybody, anybody who's gone through a home remodel, fellas, you know yes. it can be a headache. If you having those headaches or have had those headaches, give King's Mark a call. If you're redoing your bathroom, redoing your kitchen, your man cave, give King's Mark a, cab a, a, a King's Mark cabinet a call, fellas. It's like redoing your defense. It's gonna make something that doesn't look so good look a whole lot better. <laughs> listen, one of the things that I, I definitely understand. You know, listen, especially if you are a guy who's you know got a wife at home, happy wife, happy life. Look. You getting your kitchen done, you getting your bathroom done. Two things that women love to do and change often. 
you want to make sure you're going with a company that's going to be reputable, is going to take care of what it is that she wants, give her everything that she needs, and still make you feel comfortable in terms of that treatment, that service fit for a king. So I absolutely think that King's Mark is the way to go if you want to go. They're highly recommended. They do great work, everything custom. And, and again, the level of service is huge. And, and in this business, service matters, and, and that's one of the things they specialize in. Well, last night, the Eagles made a key defensive stop late in the game to secure the victory. To break that play down and more, let's head to the whiteboard. Well, we're going to break down this final play to put the nail in the coffin of the Green Bay Packers and got the Philadelphia Eagles to 2-2 two and two last night. The Green Bay Packers are threatening to score to tie the game up to take it into overtime when we see this play. And, and for, for you at home, it, you'll realize that it kind of looks similar to a play that cost the team a Super Bowl victory a couple of years ago, the Seattle Seahawks against the New England Patriots. So... On the right side here, you got two by two. You got two wide receivers. You got two wide receivers here, Aaron Rodgers, and the running back here. And what you get is you get a pick play. You know, Craig James enters the game for Monte, Avante Maddox, who had just got hurt. Um, and if you watch Malcolm Jenkins on the play, if you watch it live, what you realize is he knows that this is where Aaron Rodgers is going with the ball. So you get the rub route and Malcolm's guy goes to the corner. Malcolm takes two steps and comes back, but Craig James fights through, and he actually comes underneath to get a piece of the ball, but Malcolm is right here. If Aaron just pumps right here and goes to the corner, it's a certain touchdown, we're going to overtime. But you talk about a veteran play for Malcolm Jenkins, not only for, for James, who was just in the game, just inserted in the game to come up and get a piece of this ball and make a big play, but the but the awareness of Malcolm Jenkins that this is exactly where Aaron Rodgers was coming with the ball. The recipient right here, um, Nigel Bradham, who had dropped the interception for a potential touchdown early in the game, was the recipient of the tip. He runs it back to the 20-yard line. 20 seconds left on the clock. The offense takes the field. We kneel. Game is over. Eagles are two and two. This is the whiteboard breakdown for the day. Gentlemen? And I'm not too sure that even if that pass gets completed, if it's a touchdown, because the way that Nigel Bradham came closing in, he's popping that receiver Absolutely. right at the goal line. I'm not too sure he gets in, even if he completes he that pass. He doesn't get in. It might, <laughs> he, get if he, it, and even if he catches it, it might be it might have been a cause fumble. Mm, well, I, I think the thing that is going to probably kick Aaron Rodgers is that if he holds that, and I get it, it's a timing route, it's a very quick We've seen that play before. We've seen it didn't work before. I don't know why people keep running it. But if he gives it one more second, the rub receiver gets he's wide open in the corner of the end zone. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally a second later, he's wide open. And we're talking about an overtime game. And that's, by the way, we're killing Malcolm Jenkins for letting him go. That's a timing route because most of the time, you know, most of the time those guys are lined up, you know, about two yards apart. Mm -hmm. But they were really lined up five yards apart. So the last thing that, you know, that anybody thought, well, the, the thinking is, is that if they're lined up that far away from each other, that they're not going to run the rub route in that manner, you know. But it was so fast and it's such a timing route that that outside guy that's running the slant, he's the primary. He's the primary. And, if, and Aaron feels like, hey, if I don't give it to him, if I don't put it on him right now, Russell Wilson was thinking the same thing. If I don't put it on him right now, then, you know, we're not, we're not going to complete this pass. I got to throw it away and we got to move on to the next down. You know, so that's why teams run it, because they realize in those tight situations that they don't kick one DB inside, one corner outside, and say, okay, when they try to rub, we're just going to pass them off. We're going to banjo it. You know, if I'm sitting on the inside, the one that comes in, I got him. The one that goes out, I got him. They know that most teams are going to try to fight through that, especially when there's a ten, a five-yard gap in between them rather than a two- or three-yard gap. I want to get to a couple of comments here before we move on. Mark Seidman here at Parks wants to know, why didn't Doug run on second and five with five minutes to go in the fourth quarter? I think sometimes Doug gets to a position where he kind of reverts. You know, <laughs> I, I, I was coming unglued. You know, on that last, the last offensive possession, because I'm like, they can't stop us running nope. the football. Nope. nope. You know, all. I don't care whether they're in short yardage defense, whether they're in goal line defense, whether they're in nickel, dime, regular, whatever it is. You know, we we had two running backs that's averaged over five yards a carry. Why would we even consider in a four minute situation throwing the ball? Just run it. Even if we get three, three, and three, and then on fourth down, you decide you want to run a quarterback sneak because Carson Wentz is almost 
you know, in fourth and ones and quarterback sneaks. Do it that way. But why would you why would you risk a stopping the clock, giving Aaron Rodgers additional um, um, uh, possessions, mm -hmm. and then the throw in the flat to Jordan Howard, man? You can't make that throw, Carson Wentz, man. I mean, you you almost get him decapitated, yeah, and crushed. we that's a guy we can ill afford to lose. Absolutely. Another comment I want to get to, and this comes from everybody tweeting at me last night during the game. Why did the Eagles go for a two-point conversion when they took a seven-point lead Analytics. in the third quarter? And that, you're exactly right, Seth, <laughs> because the numbers dictate this. And I know that old-school football fans don't want to hear it, but the numbers show you when you have an opportunity to go up two possessions by turning a seven- or an eight-point lead into a nine-point lead, it outweighs getting that extra point and forcing a team to go for a two-point conversion. I understand that there was a situation at the end where if the Packers scored a touchdown, they just needed an extra point to tie it rather than a two-point conversion to tie it. But it also comes down to the breakdown of Doug Peterson valuing his offense's ability to convert a two-point conversion against his defense's ability to stop a two-point You know what conversion. my problem is? If you're, if you're into the fourth quarter, against Aaron Rodgers, possessions become, you know, like gold. I get it, in the fourth quarter. But they went for the two-point conversion in the third quarter. Okay. You know, and, and my thing is, you know, you take the points in the third quarter, realizing that they haven't stopped your offense in the last five, six possessions. So you know that every time you get it, that you have the ability to score. So now, why go for the, the, the two-point conversion just because the number says so? Now, if you're in the fourth quarter, I get it. Because now you, you go up by two. If we get another possession and we score, now it's a three-possession game. Now there's not enough time for Aaron Rodgers yes. to catch up in that scenario. But when you give him an even playing field and you don't convert, and now all of a sudden you, get, you only get six points instead of that extra seven, now even if he scores, all they got to do is kick the extra point. And we're going to overtime, where if in that scenario, if he just kicks the, the extra point and we get the one point and they score, they got to convert. Not, on, not only do they got to score, but now they got to convert, you know, a, a two point conversion just to go to overtime. You know, and I like those odds a lot better. Now, like I said, if you get into the fourth quarter, absolutely go for it. Not in the third quarter. I think, E.T., what the math is showing you also, and this is where some people are frustrated by it, but the fact that the extra point is no longer a 99% right, right, play right. does change things Agreed. because teams value their ability to get into the end zone from the two-yard line rather than that kick from the 30. And that's what changes the analytics on it. If we were talking the extra point that used to be five yards out, then yeah, okay, it's a gimme, you know, sure. When you're kicking from 30 yards, and we've seen even Jake Elliott struggle with extra points, and a lot of kickers around the NFL are not as automatic on those extra points as they used to be. You say, you know what, I could put my kicker out here, he misses it, and I get nothing for it. And we know the Eagles can block kicks. The Eagles can block kicks. So yeah, we saw that. If it came down to a situation where the Packers needed an extra point to tie it, Trust Eagles can block that kick. So the thing, the thing is, do I trust that, you know what, let me take this opportunity. If I don't get it, I'm still up to touchdown an extra point anyway. So it's not like I'm in danger of losing the game. Mm -hmm. So it's it's more so, am I playing to win or am I playing not to lose? And I like the fact that he went for the play to win because, again, you go up two, two possessions, it changes the entire scheme for the back half of the game. So, I mean, I understand it. I like it. You know, to me, there's a that's where analytics kind of has its way in the NFL. Certain things I don't agree with, like not running the ball when you're two yards out. <laughs> but, you know, going for a two-point conversion when you're up, you know, seven, I get it. Now, if you're six, no, because now you put yourself in a position where you're playing from behind, you're giving the possession away. But when you're up seven, I, I don't see the risk in it because at worst, you still force them to have to score and kick the extra point. Let's go around the NFC real quick here, guys. You talk about the Eagles and their upcoming schedule against some difficult opponents. I think the NFC is wide open. It's not a foregone conclusion of who the top team is that's going to go to the Super Bowl. These next few games are going to be important for the Eagles, but if you look at the teams around the league, no one's really separating themselves from the pack. You say the Cowboys, you say the Saints, you say the Rams, okay. I look at those teams and I say they're beatable. I look at the Eagles, I say they're beatable. I also look at the Eagles sometimes and I say they're the best team in the NFC. I think this is a wide open year, more so than what we've seen in recent I think it's, 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 it's too early in the season. And what you're seeing now after four weeks, the cream is about to rise to the top because the, the, the problem in the NFL is when you have so much turnover, you got new coaching staffs, you got new schemes, you got new players that are moving in free agency, moving around. The first four weeks, we're just trying to gain enough game film to be able to assess 
what yeah. offense, what defense you're running, who you are, what your personality is. Or extended preseason because yeah. they don't play that. So Good now, point. now that I've got four game films, I can take four game films and break you down, and I and I know who you are. Now it's really about to get interesting, okay? The, the question is, is Dak really all that in a bag of chips? We're about to find mm -hmm. out Sunday, you know, when they go down to New Orleans, okay? We know that Patrick Mahomes is the truth, but, you know, are the Rams better than they were last year? They're probably a little better because they got Cooper Cup back, and yeah. he's a major, major okay. part of what they do. But that loss to that L that they took last week, or how close they, they, they take – how close they got to taking the L last week, they look more vulnerable, you know. And at the end of the day, um, um, Sean McVay still hasn't figured out, you know, the five, six-man line thing that, that, that Bill Belichick and, uh, and Mike Flores implemented last year in the Super Bowl. You can see it on film. They have no answer for it. Hmm. And if, if they roll in the, into this year without an answer for that, for that look, every other team is going to take that look and figure out a way to beat them. So, you know, Rob, I agree with you 100%. I, I think in the NFC, it's wide open. You know, the Saints don't have Drew Brees. Teddy, Teddy Bridgewater is going to play they, some they good look football. All right. they, look yeah, <laughs> they, they look all right, but, I'm, but they, they're not what they're right. – when you play against a better team, a better defense, I mean, they're going to have some stress against Dallas mm -hmm. when they play. But, but I, can, I can guarantee you they're going to play at a different level because they're going to be home. They're remembering that beatdown that they took. That ass whooping they took last year on national TV, that's going to play a role. Um, but they're not going to be as dynamic with Teddy Bridgewater. Even though he's, you know, more than capable of getting the job done, they're not going to be as dynamic with him at quarterback as they would as, as they would be, you know, with, with, with Drew Brees. That's just a fact, man. What about inside the division, E.T.? Does the emergence of Daniel Jones change your outlook on this NFC East? Does it elevate the Giants to a point where you consider them a, a threat? Uh, no, I think at best the Giants are, uh, you know, if Daniel Jones does what he expects to do, listen, it was great that they beat Tampa Bay. Well, Saquon but, being out for a couple and, weeks. And that's where I was going. Lot, Saquon yeah. being out four to six weeks is going to matter. Nobody is scared of Wayne Gallman. No disrespect to Wayne Gallman. But here's what I'm saying. Now you've seen a little bit of Daniel Jones. You're going to see how teams scheme differently against him. And what's going to happen is now when they start to play teams, especially division games, you're going to see what it is that they actually are made of. I don't think they finished bottom of the division anymore. I think at one point they were battling for a topic in the draft. Now that belongs to the Washington Redskins. What I do think is they might finish, you know, 6-10, and 7-9, 8-8, eight eight, somewhere around there. So they are going to have an opportunity to, you know, make their season respectable and kind of see the growth of Daniel Jones. But do I think that they win the division or compete for it? No. I'm not. It's a two-horse race. You're talking about Tampa Bay. Right. You know, Tampa Bay defensively. You know, they got an all-star at defense coordinator and Todd Bowles, but I'm not so sure that they're equipped personnel-wise to do a lot of stuff that he wants to do. Right. Daniel Jones, you know, people are going to realize that the way you're going to have to beat him, you, you want to make him play the game from the pocket. Pocket. If pocket. you can, yep. if you got to spy, then spy and make him play the game from the pocket. But if you let him get out of the pocket, he can wreak all kind of havoc, you know, on your on your defense. And and in my opinion, the smart defense coordinators are just not gonna let that happen. We agree. We're gonna get to our bet breakdown, a couple of picks that we like coming up this Sunday, week four in the NFL, right after this word from Parks. I'm like sad warfare, man. What a night. The new Parks Casino $10 million sports book changes everything. It's a whole new ball game at Parks Casino. Watch every single game and sporting event you want on our custom built 154 foot wide, $1.5 million screen, capable of showing 36 events at once. Bet all the hot action and enjoy tap after tap of amazing craft beer, cocktails, and pub food favorites. Your entire game day destination is here for you and your friends. Sports book, beer garden, and Liberty Bell Gastro Pub. Parks Casino, bet with the best. I'm going to kick off this week's bet breakdown with a pick that I think is a, a lock just to win. It's it's too good to be true almost. The Colts laying seven at home against the Oakland Raiders might as well be a gift. Buy it down to six and a half if you have to, but you don't even have to do that. The Raiders are looking ahead to their international trip. This is just not a good spot for them. On the road in their last 16 games, the Oakland Raiders are 2-14 and 14 straight up. 3-12-1 against the spread. Jacoby Brissett is playing a lot better. He has looked great filling in for Andrew Luck. People are not even talking about Andrew Luck anymore in Indianapolis because of the way that Jacoby Brissett is playing. If T.Y. Hilton misses the game and he did miss some practice this week, that does give you cause for concern. I still think the Colts go out there and beat the Raiders easily. 
I'll lay the seven. Give me the Colts. So for me, I, I've got the Denver Broncos uh, giving three and a half to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, the Jacksonville Jaguars played great football last week. Most folks thought they were going to lay down. We already are hearing about the myths of, of uh, Minshew mania. You know, Gardner Minshew's looking like, you know, basically Nick Foles got Nick Foles. He's going to be back to being an overpaid backup again. Uh, but the problem is Jalen Ramsey, you know, he basically is caught out of work all week. First it was, you know, I think I might have the flu. Then it was, you know, now I'm having a kid. Now it's basically, look, I've said I want to be traded. I don't want to play here anymore. The, the, the relationship is irreparable. There's just too many distractions. And because he is such a huge cog to that defense, they're going to have to change their scheme. Granted, A.J. Boye is playing great, but I think that's also a product of the fact that, listen, when you got Jalen Ramsey on the other side, the guy on the other side is going to look pretty good too. Uh, I, I think that it just changes too many dynamics. Denver's at home. It's mile hot. They've got to get a win. I don't think they've played bad in their last few games. They've had some bad luck. Um, I think that the Denver Broncos win this game outright. Uh, they're going to cover uh, easily. I think that they went by uh, seven points here. So I like Denver uh, minus three and a half over the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, the Eagles have 10 days off before their next game. They're going to take on the Jets, who are going to be coming off their bye, so they have some time to be rested and get healthy as well, which is very important because their quarterback, Sam Darnold, has been dealing with mono, you know, too much making out for Sam Darnold. Uh, yeah, with so randoms. It, with Stop randoms. It. You never know why, why he got that mono. But let's get to our King's Mark keys to the game. Before we do that, though, I want to read a comment from Judy Watson. who says she hopes all is well with Avante Maddox. Uh, their pr thoughts and prayers for Maddox, and, and you said, Seth, that after the game, he was joking around, he was in good spirits, had movement in all his extremities, so that's the best scenario that you could find out he for He actually Avante wanted Maddox. to get up, and, you know, they, right. made, they made him stay down to make, good. make sure everything was okay. Good. All right, our keys to the victory against the Jets, brought to you by Kingsmark, and Seth, you said you're going to quit <laughs> if all they lose this game. All forms of media <laughs> if they lose this game. Man. I mean, there, there's just, you know, they just got one weapon on offense, yep. and that's, that's Le'Veon Bell. So Correct. all you got to do is take care of that one guy. You know, the key to me <laughs> to this offense is our ability to run the ball, and I don't think this week is any different. I, I, you're going to have some games where, you know, the passing game should be extremely prevalent against teams who, A, don't have a good pass rush and aren't good in pass coverage. Yeah, you got to take advantage of that, you know. But right now, in order for this offense to find its rhythm, I believe their rhythm comes through, you know, Miles Sanders and Jordan Howard. You know, that's going to allow them to do whatever they want to do. Now, it, when the Jets roll in here, if Carson Wentz throws the ball 40 times, you know, I'm going to be really upset because you've got the blueprint for how to win. Let's just follow it, you know. And the defense, you know, it'll be a good week for the defense to get well too because they don't have a whole lot on the offensive side of the ball. And, you know, I don't know what we're going to look like in the secondary, but, you know, confidence – you know, breeds enthusiasm. Enthusiasm helps victories. You know, so if they can get well defensively against the Jets, get some sacks, you know, a couple of guys get multiple sacks, um, I think this is a game that they need to take the next step in their confidence. And I just don't see any way that they, that they lose the game. So you, you go down the list of the weapons, as you mentioned. They've got Le'Veon Bell. they got Robbie Anderson, proud of Temple. Don't know where he's doing right now. you got Quincy Anuma, who's out with another neck injury. Might be the end of his career. you got Chris Herndon, who's suspended. I mean, you look at what they have. They don't have much. On the defensive side of the ball, they got Quentin Williams, their highly touted defensive lineman that they drafted. He, uh, you know, has been in and out with some injuries. I think the key to this game, you got to put eight in the box. You have to absolutely keep eyes on Le'Veon Bell at all times. And the big thing is go with what we know. You know what works. Run the football. Jordan Howard should have another monster game against a team that is not very stout. C.J. Mosley's also hobbled. I mean, they have the, they have a blueprint and a recipe for success against a team that's playing for nothing. You don't know if Darnold's going to play. You know, if they got Falk again, you know, listen, it's like, you know, getting gifts for Christmas in the middle of, you know, <laughs> October. Like, you know, tee up and have fun. Right. You know, but at the same time, they have to show up. Don't overlook this team. Don't take them for granted. Listen, Agreed. as a Dolphins fan, Adam Gay stinks as a head coach. I know it firsthand. <laughs> Do I think that he's learned anything from Miami? No, not from what I've seen in New, New York, but that doesn't mean that with a guy like Le'Veon Bell, he doesn't find ways to get him the ball in space. We've seen what damage guys, playmakers can do, so you contain him, they, they should win easily. And keep the pressure on Sam Darnold and that offensive line. That offensive line has been putrid to start the season. Yeah. 
they did not play a single snap together in the preseason. So these first three games was, was their learning curve. I expect them to be better in week five. You mentioned tight end Chris Herndon. He does come back from suspension, and Sam Donald did love him in the preseason, so that's someone you have to keep an eye on. But if they keep the pressure on Sam Donald, force this offensive line to block an extra guy, maybe keep an extra guy in to protect Sam Donald, the Eagles should have no problem in this game. There it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, before we get out of here, make sure you guys continue to keep sharing this show. It's every single dollar for a share is going to go to the Malcolm Jenkins Foundation uh, for the underprivileged youths. So we definitely want to make sure we do that. Uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in and watching. Hit them high right here in my new Philly where something's always new. And, and everything, everything is always, always new. Philly.